Beautiful as always, choir. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, being instruments of peace and how that happens. Um, welcome to our sermon series today. Barbara started us on a sermon series based off the New York Times best-selling book, Atomic Habits. Uh, and we're entering into this series as a bit of a, uh, I feel like sometimes when it comes to the Lenten season, we can feel a bit lost, maybe. Uh, feel like uh, we're, you know, we, we have these maybe expectations of spiritual disciplines, of fasting, or what Barb reminded us last week of adding something. And it can be hard to know what to do or necessarily how to do that, especially successfully. Um, so while this gets set up, I wanted to ask everyone, uh, uh, who has maybe in the past or in this Lenten season, uh, who is looking to uh, also question the choir? Also, choir, we have slides today. If you'd like to come see the slides, you can come on down. Uh, 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 who has in the past kind of like taken up this call for either fasting or trying to add something during this season? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, we got a few. Jake, uh, our wonderful lay reader today. Jake, wh what did you add or subtract uh, during Lent? Yeah. Yeah, cutting out bread, no doubt. And how did that go? Do you feel like, you know, lasted the whole time? Did it kind of peter out? Where, where were you at? Nice. <laughs> That's honest, and I love it. Uh, anyone else? I saw a few other hands. Uh, Julianne, you want to share? Less words of criticism, more words of affirmation. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Um, uh, and listen, uh, you know, maybe you might want to take away something during the season. Maybe we might want to add something. Uh, all of that uh, is going to take uh, a bit of self-control. And I, for one, have always struggled with self-control. Uh, I'm reminded of it every time uh, I'm in the midst of uh, our kids who come here to church. Uh, because we have a kid who is a kindred spirit to me. Uh, uh, if you don't know James, uh, James has a sweet tooth, um, and uh, we, all, we have a huge thing of candy in the office just sitting there, and, uh, and when that door opens, the occasionally time it does on a Sunday, and I see James walking out, I see those pockets stuffed with candy. He has taken handfuls and handfuls, uh, and I did the same exact thing. Uh, you know, my mom had a bowl of candy in her office, and it was for the entire church. Uh, but I had eaten 90% of all the candy that was in the basket at all times. Now, I'm going to pull a small Ron Swanson. Uh, uh, I'm not saying I ate 90% of that one basket. I'm saying after all the refills, years and years of it, being at every church week, I had 90% of all the candy in there. Um, and in struggling with self-control, uh, maybe this is a thing for me, but maybe you feel it also, is that when we maybe fail to do the things that we set out to do, or maybe we do the things that we don't want to do but do them anyway, there comes an air of shame, right? Uh, and, uh, you know... Uh, whenever I did the thing I knew I wasn't supposed to do, I didn't need anyone else to yell at me. Because internally, I was yelling at myself. I'd maybe call myself names in the midst of doing the thing I didn't want to do to try to get me to not do it. Uh, or I'd do that little, I don't know if you've ever done the snap band bracelet. Uh, I tried the little snap band bracelet every time I got like a craving for candy. It snapped myself. It doesn't work. Uh, uh, but... Shame carried with me as I did the things I knew weren't good for me. And when shame I carried, and with the shame I carried, carried a diminished sense of my self-worth. I felt cowardly that I couldn't stop the things I wanted to stop. And maybe not shockingly enough, no amount of band slaps or horrible names I called myself worked. And in 2 Timothy, 
we learn about a person and a people also dealing with shame. Our scripture today will be in the letter of 2 Timothy. And this letter is fascinating. This is very much a farewell letter. Uh, You see, in 2 Timothy, it has the Apostle Paul in prison, abandoned by his friends, and facing imminent death. This letter acts like a final testament from Paul to Timothy and anyone else who may be reading it. Uh, Juet Bassler, an author of the editor of the HarperCollins Study Bible, explains it as a letter from a dying patriarch exhorting and blessing a faithful child, warning him of problems to come. And this letter is dire. This is a letter written like someone who is expecting imminent death. And I think that's fascinating because it has me thinking. What would I want to remind people of if I was writing a final words letter? From friend to friend, from mentor to mentee, what would I write? What instruction would I give? What would I want people to know? And I think the beginning of this letter gets it really right. Second Timothy starts off with a section of thanksgiving that I think helps clues us into uh, uh, what these ex- people are experiencing and the shame they're experiencing. Um, so, let's see if this works. That it did. You love to see it. Uh, so we're going to start in Second Timothy chapter one, verse three. If you'd like to join me, but it reads like this: I am grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers, day and night, recalling your tears. I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. And you know, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to kindle the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of hands. And we're going to skip ahead to chapter, uh, or to verse 8, where it says this. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. You know, I think Paul makes a few interesting Uh, interesting plays here. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, Paul's reminding Timothy and whoever may read it afterwards to not be ashamed of their faith. You know, I often think of people being ashamed of their faith in the modern times, uh, feeling shame and doubt by looking at uh, some like news or online something, seeing people claim the same faith as you, but do something really horrific. But shame is not new. People back in Paul's time also felt shame And we can get this up front and clear from things like in chapter 8, right, when Paul instructs Timothy to not be ashamed. But we also have Paul doing some very savvy things. Paul says he worships with a clear conscience. He feels no shame worshiping. Then reminded them that their faith is old, right? They have the faith of their ancestors. Their faith has stood the test of time. Paul refers to Timothy's faith as sincere. Not only is this your life, Timothy, but you have this life uh, because this isn't some fake thing you do for money. This is who you are. And not only is this your life, but you have this faith because of special people in your life, like your grandmother and your mother, tying the faith back to a familial connection. In these verses, Paul seemed to be really starting strongly, combating a shame people may be feeling because of their faith. And they could be feeling this way for a few reasons. Uh, For starters, surely it's not good PR for one of your stalwarts of faith to be in prison, right? Paul's face on the news tablets of ancient Ephesus, front page with his picture saying, warning, dangerous criminal, worships the god Yahweh. And down below is like an attached article of 10 other religious uh, leaders and religions you can join whose leaders aren't in jail. 
In a polytheistic society, I can't imagine the optics of this look too good from the outside in. Right, like imagine you join this community, you're loving it, you're having a great time, only to find out the next week that Barb has gone to jail. Barb hasn't gone to jail. Shout out to Barb. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, right, you're asking, like, can we trust this person? From Pastor Alan Hickman uh, uh, of Hickman, uh, or Pastor Allen of Hickman Presbyterian in Nebraska, he writes about another way uh, they may be feeling shame. Uh, and he writes, I wonder if they felt shamed because they found themselves feeling discouraged from going against the grain all the time. Taking up a countercultural lifestyle can be energizing, especially at first. But after months and years of swimming upstream, it can get exhausting. I wonder if Timothy and the believers in Ephesus were feeling the presence of the sacrifices and ostracism and opposition that can be part of what it meant to be Christian for them. You see, it seems their environment wasn't really set up for them to succeed. They have people probably trying to use enormous amounts of willpower and self-control to, to try and keep the faith in such opposition. And as we were reading, I skipped over verse 7. Because I think it's there that Paul gives a really helpful reminder and one of the most powerful verses about God's spirit. And it reads like this. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. This verse seeks to uplift those who are feeling broken. The context of this verse, right, isn't for people who are already in power to gain more power. This verse is for a broken down community on their lax legs, feeling the walls of shame and isolation closing in on them. And I picked this verse because if Paul's testament is that we have this spirit inside us and that doesn't produce shame or cowardice, but love, power, and self-control, then James Clear's message is that we can move from what's in here to out there. I find that in adding new things or trying to fast from something that we can get discouraged or even uh, stop ourselves from trying, right? Why fail? Oh, I've never kept up with these things. Or, oh, I've tried in the past and it just wasn't for me. If we believe and trust in God's power in us, then we can also take practical steps to see the change we want to have, to live up to God's spirit already within us. So let's take a look at practical applications that we can take uh, that help us remove shame from self-control. In the book Atomic Habits, James Clear cites an article done by Bobby P. Smith called Lapse and Relapse Following Inpatient Treatment of Opiate, opiate uh, Dependence, which was published in the Irish Medical Journal of June of 2010. This study looks at uh, meth addicts and followed their journey to see percentages of relapse after treatment and why they may have relapsed. And in the article's introduction, they write, it has been known for many years that addictive disorders tend to run a chronic relapse course, right? Those who take addictive drugs are known to relapse. Despite the robust evidence demonstrating the effectiveness of methadone maintenance in the treatment of opiate dependence, many patients seek abstinence-based treatments. They found that many people they had studied sought abstinence-based treatment, a treatment based on how much willpower or self-control they can muster up to fight off a powerful addiction. And here's what they found. Following up interviews were conducted with 109 patients, of whom 99, so 91%, reported a relapse. The initial relapse occurred within one week um, in 59% of cases. A multiviral survival, survival analysis revealed that earlier relapse was significantly predicted by younger age, greater heroin use prior to treatment, history of injecting, and a failure to enter into aftercare. And James Clear compares this study done uh, 
right here to a study done by Lee Robbins, who's published uh, articles of uh, Vietnam veterans three years after Vietnam, uh, and uh, how permanent was Vietnam drug addiction. His team uh, found that out of a sample of 470 soldiers, um, uh, his team found that, uh, uh, that 35% of service members in Vietnam who had tried heroin, and as many as 20% became addicted, but then found something interesting as they returned home. When soldiers who had used heroin uh, returned home, 5% became re-addicted within a year, and just 12% relapsed within three years. So approximately nine out of 10 soldiers who used heroin in Vietnam eliminated their addiction nearly overnight. So what's the difference? Do these soldiers have superior willpower? Is that just the American difference? Did we have the self-control of gods among men? There's almost nothing different between these soldiers and the, and the study of those who relapsed from previous studies found. James Clear notes that their ability to get clean had almost nothing to do with them and almost everything to do with their environment. Uh, James writes this. He says, The Vietnam studies ran counter to many of our cultural beliefs about bad habits because it challenged the conventional association of unhealthy behavior as a moral weakness. Um, if you're overweight, a smoker, an addict, You've been told your entire life that you lack self-control, maybe even that you're a bad person. The idea that a little bit of discipline will solve all your problems is deeply embedded in our culture. Recent research, however, shows something different. When scientists analyze people who appear to have tremendous self-control, it turns out those individuals aren't at all different from those who are struggling. Instead, quote-unquote, disciplined people are better at structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower and self-control. In other words, they spend less time in tempting situations. As soldiers returned home, uh, Washington learned of these soldiers and this addiction that had kind of taken place. And so they created programs like the Special Action Office of Drug Abuse Prevention, helping them in the recovery stage. And the neighborhood's environments that they came back to were nearly devoid of the triggers for them to relapse. So you want to know the secret of self-control? According to James Clear, it has almost nothing to do with you. And it has almost everything to do with our environment. He writes, Once a habit has been encoded, the urge to act follows whenever the environment cues reappear. This is one reason behavior change techniques backfire. Shaming people with late loss preventions, uh, presentations can make them feel stressed. And as a result, many people will turn to their favorite coping strategy. Showing pictures of blackened lungs to smokers to higher, uh, leads to a higher level of anxiety, which drives many people to reach for a cigarette. Right? If you're not careful about cues, you can cause the very behavior you want to stop. And from what James uh, proposes is a simple formula. A formula intended to help us form and stick to new habits that we'd like to have. And the formula is this. I will behavior at time in location. I will behavior at time in location. Uh, meditation. I will meditate for one minute at 7 a.m. in my kitchen. Studying. I will study Spanish for 20 minutes at 6 p.m. in my bedroom. Marriage. I will make my partner a cup of tea at 8 a.m. in the kitchen. You're welcome for whoever that helps. Uh, pretty simple, right? If you're a goal-oriented person, this kind of feels like smart goals. Uh, this formula is called implementation intention and has effective results. In 20, uh, 2001, researchers in Great Britain began working with 248 people to build better exercise habits over the course of two weeks. And so they separated all 248 of them into three groups. 
One was the control group, and they simply asked you, asked them, they said, track how often you exercise. Two was the motivation group. They asked them to track their workouts, but also had material presented to them about the benefits of exercise, right? How exercise could reduce their risk of heart disease and improve their heart health. And three, these subjects received all the same things, you know, uh, uh, track how often you exercise, and uh, here's this presentation on your heart health from exercise. But they were also asked to formulate a plan of when and where they would exercise the following week. In the first two groups, about 35 to 38 percent of people went to the gym. 91 percent of the last group did the habits they were asked to do. Because when we can not only create our plan, but also visualize when and where we'd like to see it done, the odds of performing said habit the, it skyrockets. To further increase our odds by sticking to a new habit, this next formula uh, is habit stacking. Because we are creatures of habit. And it is a good idea for our implementations and st intentions, man, that's a hard word to get out, uh, to stack onto an old habit. Uh, so, meditation. After I pour my cup of coffee each morning, morning, previous habit, current habit, I will meditate for one minute. After I get home from work, current habit, I will study Spanish for 20 minutes. New habit. After I get into bed at night, current habit, I will give my partner a kiss. These formulas help shape our environment into environments that lend themselves to us forming new habits. We don't need superhuman will or discipline to do something new. Just some time to think about what we want to do and formulate where we'll do it. Our environment matters more. A stable environment where people have a place and a purpose, where everything has a place and a purpose, is an environment where habits can easily form. And if you'd like to join Barb and I in this Lenten exercise to try and form new habits, uh, feel free to join me in the library after service today. Um, uh, where it doesn't have to be long, but at least we can form an implementation intention so that you have something to walk away with if you'd like. I was reminded of the importance of Lent this morning by uh, an Episcopalian priest friend. The reminder that Lenten season is less about turning away from chocolate, but learning to turn into the love of God. And we do that through spiritual disciplines, praying, reading the Bible, acts of service, fasting, all requiring acts of self-control. And there are things we may want to add or take away, and those things are possible to do. There are practical formulas to follow, and listen, if you don't get it right all the time, that's okay. We're not striving for perfection. There's no shame in not succeeding in implementing a new habit, because we don't worship the God of shame. We don't worship the God of cowardice. We worship the God of love, power, and self-control, Join me in worshiping that God this morning.